Okay, thank you very much for this opportunity to speak to you all about this very important topic of future landscapes. It's one that um, actually made me reflect on my own trajectory a little bit, which started off uh, in the ecological sciences, um, studying over at Masters and <coughs> DPhil over at the Environmental Change Institute in Oxford, and realising that um, as much as I loved my transects and my quadrats <laughs> and <laughs> picking out all those seedlings, um, I was really, really concerned about the driving changes that meant that the forest that I was studying at the time, which happened to be the cloud forest in Tenerife in the Canary Islands, there was only 1% left. And I was told by my rather unenlightened supervisor at the time that those sorts of questions were not science and had no place in my DPhil. Hence, I started again. <laughs> so this is a little bit of a personal trajectory. And I should also say I grew up with one foot in a very much a farming family. My f mother was the one, first one of her 50 first cousins to uh, finish high school and leave the dairy farming district. Uh, and also very much 1970s back to land uh, environmentalist living in a mud house with homemade undies. <laughs> so the whole kit and caboodle. So this is sort of like my kind of like little psychological kind of analysis. <laughs> You've kind of got the whole gamut here. So I'm gonna, it's a little bit of a, um, a little bit of a uh, psychedelic tour, so let's go. Okay, I should also say I teach climate change responses to a very eclectic group of students uh, in a very confusing country. Uh, and so I've had to kind of um, do a lot of thinking to try to come up with these ways of understanding climate change in Australia. And one of the key uh, diagrams that I find most useful for understanding Australia, and it's actually unfortunately, particularly timely at the moment, is this one here, I'm not sure if you can see it, it's the hydroelogical cycle uh, put together by the Drought Mitigation Centre over in the US. Uh, and um, it'd be interesting to work out which part of the cycle we're in at the moment. Those who've put together drought policy over the last few decades probably thought we'd just lifted out of it, but we're back in it. Um, and uh, we're probably at that panic stage. But one of the things about Australia is uh, we, of course, um, have come into this country uh, with a kind of British lens, and that's meant that the extreme climatic variability that is part of this continent uh, has continued to uh, shock and awe us. Uh, and in fact, part of our, Brit our Australian identity, as opposed to the British identity, has been coming to terms with that and developing a love of that, which is the sort of what I call the Dorothy McKellar syndrome this kind of excitement uh, that comes, this love of the uh, land of flooding, uh, I was gonna say flooding droughts, uh, <laughs> <laughs> sweeping plains and, and droughts and you know, et cetera, et cetera. I should have recited the poem. Um, but you know what I mean? And this is the one that means that we're sort of torn so that when we do have terrible droughts, um, we understand that they're part of our longer lineage, but then we also silently cheer when they break a record, we're like, yes and the one proves Australia is the most climate variable continent on earth. Thank you very much. Um, so we sort of have this kind of mixed approach to it, which means that in, I think we have a particularly difficult time getting out of the hydroelogical cycle because it's kind of part of our psyche. So that's the sort of context. We're in this kind of bouncy back kind of country. Um, we also are in one uh, where we have a particular sort of love of magical thinking. Um, where we're hoping that something will just go away and I'll just leave it there really, it's all that needs to be said in the current <laughs> political environment. The other one is um, something that I find uh, is a challenge with the climate change story which is that there's a huge amount of emphasis on the human fingerprint if you like on the climate signal, on working it out, on proving it, on arguing it, on attributing it in any particular single event. Whereas the actual context is kind of taken as just kind of as is. And yet working out that sort of human fingerprint on that existing context is extremely important because it's those intersections which is where climate change impacts emerge and where climate change action has to happen at that intersection point. So climate change impacts don't just kind of come like a bolt of the, out of the blue. 
into the current day, they're very much the intersection with what we existing already have. And so as I explained to the students, climate change actually requires we understand everything about the world. <laughs> so it's a bit of a tough course. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a flash audit because it requires us to actually say, all right, so how did we get to this point? How do we get to the point that climate change has emerged? How do we get to the point where climate change impacts are distributed unevenly across society in the way they are? That adaptation capacity is <laughs> distributed unevenly across society. That mitigation is resisted. What is it that's gluing all of these things together? Because to my mind, there's kind of some pretty core fundamentals that mean all of those things are part of the current context. And so we need to have a much more sophisticated understanding of ourselves, of this world, of our social ecological context, if we are to better cope and address <coughs> climate change. And of course, all of these things um, you know, are very much interacted. And I left the arrows there, but the students get about 20 more. <laughs> OK. So what I want to talk about today is what I've called the triple resilience challenge. And it's this depletion, we could say degradation, but I'm using depletion in a kind of theoretical sense of this sense of just drawing out of it. So degradation is where function starts to break down, that's certainly part of it. But the process, the driving process behind that, degradation is the consequence, depletion is the process driving it. It's this continual drawdown on the physical landscape. Similarly, a depletion of the social landscape, which means that we have to put together disciplines and fields that don't tend to talk to each other. And underlying all that is what I've called here an erosive socio-cultural and political landscape, which means that we value things in certain ways, that we code things in certain ways, and it alters what well, we heard Monica talk about, the window that we look at. Okay, we need to switch windows. We need to turn around and look at another window in order to actually address the seriousness of climate change. And this is not only to address climate change in the sense of resilience and adaptation, which tends to be primarily what I talk about, but also because this is where the crux of climate change is being generated. Okay, it's the same cultural flaws that are generating both vulnerabilities to climate change and the existence of anthropogenic climate change in the first place. Now, putting those things together actually has a huge resonance with stuff that was done back at the start of what is now in our Anthropocene era called the Great Acceleration, which is, I've got to say, a really, really bad name because <laughs> there's nothing great about it. But something that was particularly uh, perhaps better named is the great transformation uh, that Cole Polanyi that you probably heard about um, has talked about. He was an economist who was looking at the state of the world prior to the um, or in the midst of um, the World Wars, he was writing all these uh, different uh, treaties about it. And in 1944, he talked about the intersection between the crises in land and labour, and he talked about money as well. And focusing on the land and the labour, what he saw was this process of trying to create self-regulating markets in each of those things, which means reducing them to commodities, disembedding them from their social and ecological context as if they're abstractions that can be given a market price and sold. And actually then creating a situation that caused so much hardship in so many ways that there was this huge wave of reaction and social resistance. And he sees huge uh, connections across all sorts of social processes and movements that emerged at that time. Now, without going into it too much, the, the point is that commentators as wise as Nancy Fraser are seeing great parallels in the current situation as to that, current, uh, that situation. Now that's not to say we're predicting world war, but it does give a sense of the sort of scale and scope and the seriousness of the current situation. It's also, I think, quite telling that it is at that time that this so-called great acceleration, so this is one of the diagrams I'm sure you're familiar with from Anthropocene science, or this is particularly Earth system science, not the geological side of things, uh, where around, they say, circa 1950, there was this incredible push 
to actually uh, amplify our production, amplify our consumption. It was quite deliberate as an economy uh, recovery process after the world wars. And that led to this logarithmic increase uh, in so many of the processes that we're suffering the results of today. And so there's this sense that we actually need to see things in this integrated way, that we actually have to look at those interconnections. And that's what I take from this, is the interconnected nature of these crises. So that when we hear about problems about low wages and um, money being taken from the disability fund, for example, that is not coincidental to the environmental crisis that we might be more familiar with. These are part of a similar set of reasonings and rationalities. Okay, so I want to focus now on what I've called here the erosive socio-cultural and political landscape. So this is playing with landscape and I'll come to the, this other um, notion of landscape in a little bit. But for now, just go with me for a while. This is a metaphoric use of the word landscape. And what I want to argue is that at the root of those shared crises is a systematic devaluation of anything to do with the reproductive realm relative to the productive realm. Anything that is coded as soft as opposed to hard. And so what we're talking about here is the famous uh, uh, reification of production, of innovation, of new things, of products, the things that can be sold over the private realm, over anything that actually just requires ongoing daily maintenance. Because it's all of that ongoing daily maintenance, whether it's done by worms or women, that is absolutely invisible to most of society. What happens is that we tend to valorise it, we celebrate it, and we have photos of people jumping up and down with excitement at being volunteers in uh, very, very worthwhile uh, activities, but we don't put the economics behind it, we don't put the serious backing behind it. It's considered to uh, afford itself a kind of affective, intangible benefit where we all come away feeling good, but then go and do our real work. It's not considered real work. And likewise, ecological services, are they're, they're celebrated, they're more and more popular, natural capital is attracting even the attention of big banks. You know, this is something that's there, but it's not necessarily valued. I should also say, and I don't want to get into the kind of nitty gritty of this, but putting a market price on something is not the same as valuing it and backing it economically. So what I'm trying to suggest here is that there's a big similarity, a big symbolic similarity that has to be dealt with here. And so what this means is that if you come down to the bottom, as the great Val Plumwood, one of Australia's greatest ever thinkers, um, has argued at the base of Western culture is this notion that the true self, the true human self, the rational self, the Descartian mind, is the masculine, it's the hard, it's the productive, and the rest is not quite as good. And that is something that I think underpins so many of our problems today. I also just want to make a note here that this is not, it is not a, a male-female thing, it's about coding, okay? Masculinity as a gender, femininity as a gender, okay? So a woman can be highly, highly masculine and often has to be, to be successful. You get sent on leadership courses on how to do that. Um, <laughs> but what I'm, so it's not about the, that biological side of it, it's about trying to pretend that we're not embodied. It's trying to pre pretend that we're actually disembodied, abstract, rational minds. Okay, so what's an example of this? Ooh. Okay, um, so just as a really uh, brief example from the um, August uh, parliamentary inquiry into impacts of climate change on housing, buildings, infrastructure, you know, one of the um, groups, this is the Australian Council, uh, Coastal Councils Association, pointed to this disjuncture, which I'm sure many, many of you are familiar with, between this increasing devolution of responsibilities for climate change action onto the local sphere, and that's considered to have a kind of rational benefit, um, uh, basis because climate change impacts are context specific, etc., etc., and yet, of course, that is one of the most under resourced realms. And so, you actually have an exacerbation 
of this devaluation of the social reproductive sphere uh, under climate change responses as currently uh, practiced. So the other part of it is of course climate change requires we put more and more effort into maintaining our uh, landscapes. We have to restore them, we have to regenerate them. This is the heart of adaptation is doing that sort of work. And so we really, really need to deal with this issue of devaluation if we're actually going to be able to do that. Whether you're talking about the people and the communities involved, whether you're talking about the physical landscape and the biodiversity involved, all of it requires that we pay much more attention to that reproductive realm and actually value that maintenance work that is required because adaptation is as much about maintenance as it is about innovation. So when we talk about adaptations, there is actually a very, it's totally kind of used in this non-reflexive way, but this division of adaptations in amongst the many, many typologies of adaptations called hard and soft. And typically the hard ones are stuff like bridges, uh, protected uh, controlled environment agriculture, uh, fences, equipment, etc. Uh, the nation building type stuff. Uh, think Snowy Hydro 2.0. Um, Whereas the soft stuff is actually, in a difficulty sense, much harder. And it's the stuff about goals and practices and relationships and laws. The things that I'm sure many of you are very familiar with, but because it's intangible, it is much, much more difficult. And it actually requires that we tackle the very word soft. <laughs> so it's sort of ironic. One of the things is that with this kind of um, split between hard and soft adaptations, you risk two traps. So the one trap is where the soft realm is uh, further depleted and it becomes so depleted it becomes dysfunctional and I'm sure anyone looking at that poor man with his head in his hands uh, can feel great empathy. But it's this sense of actually uh, eroding to the point of not being able to continue. And that's what we risk when you think you use kind of anodyne terms like rural decline. That's what we're talking about because that is part of this kind of ecological, socio-ecological uh, issue. Just very briefly, some work I did in the Millennium Drought five-year study looking at farm families and households and communities and how they were coping and we didn't know at the time it was going to be a five-year study. Uh, we're very grateful to Birchip Cropping Group for continuing it, continuing it as the um, the drought continued, and I should say this was their first foray into social research, which was incredibly uh, courageous of them. But what you see here, this is a kind of depiction of some of the households that we were coping with. So the kind of way in which they were actually eroding their conditions of production. I'm sure all of you can think of decisions you've made where you've actually eroded your conditions of production because you're trying to get that short term gain, whether it's a sleepless night to get through the next day etc, etc. But when you don't get the chance to do the bouncing back, this becomes extremely problematic. The other side of things is when you have too much hard adaptations without any of the soft stuff, which requires reflexivity, critical thinking, are we going in the right direction, you fall into what resilient scientists call the rigidity trap. And the Queensland droughts gave Australia a great insight into this. Because what we had there was we had flooded coal mines, so those highly centralised, and I'm talking centralised spatially, but of course uh, in an ownership sense as well, cumbersome energy systems. But there were also huge issues with food security in towns as developed cities like Rockhampton, because the very highly vertically integrated food um, supply chains, as well as hugely uh, standardised uh, food standards, meant that big groups like Coles were unable to get the goods into those um, supermarkets and there wasn't a redundant food system. So it was a good insight into two aspects of the rigidity trap. So the question is, how do we build more regenerative social and physical landscapes? And I'm sure people in this room have more examples to tell than I can. One that I'm familiar with, and of course none of these examples are perfect, but one that I find inspiring is called Wide Open Agriculture in um, Western Australia where they are working with a group called Common Land, which is based on four returns, social capital, natural capital, financial capital, and inspiration. And they've gone to the stock exchange and floated this, saying they're gonna to try to rebuild inspiration. And to me, I'm just in awe of their courage in actually putting that out there as part of their kind of business plan. I think that's great. So 
the other thing about thinking about this is how do we scale up? We hear a lot about scaling up. So in so, uh, an area of research called sustainability transitions management, uh, they talk about niches being nested within broader regimes and those regimes being uh, nested within broader landscapes. And again, landscapes used metaphorically here. But to actually get real physical landscape scale change requires that we don't only scale up in a horizontal sense of building it out, building it out, but we actually scale, um, sorry, I said that the wrong way, scale out, we actually scale up vertically or down deep into the landscape zone. This is where you're talking about worldviews. This is where you're talking about the socio-cultural roots of these issues that I've been talking about. And so there's more and more interest. I feel like there's a general kind of zeitgeist at the moment of starting to actually say, how do we think about the world? Because it doesn't seem to be really working. And so there's this sense that actually we have to do it. The other thing that this theory actually really helps to draw out is that these are full of incumbents, okay? otherwise known as vested interests. This is, niches don't exist in a vacuum. And so as much as we need to kind of valorise and value the soft, we have to realise this is a tough fight that we're facing as well. So just to finish, we have to think about how we think about the Australian landscape, think about what we value, think about what we see, what window we look out. We have to think about what socio-cultural landscape in a metaphorical sense we actually need to create the landscape that we want. Do we want the sheep and wheat map? the nothingness map, which features deranged gunmen and other type things? <laughs> do we want to celebrate the beautiful uh, map of all the indigenous cultures, the bioregions? Do we want the fossil fuel tenements? What way do we want to see Australia? And therefore, what do we have to do to actually start uh, restoring our ability to do that? And I would argue we have to look at that reproductive realm and start to value that because that's where the hard work lies.